Hello again. I'm saying good morning because it's good morning in Manchester in the studio. I don't know where you are, what time it is, what country in. But uh, we're having a day seminar and we're filming it. So this is morning. And I'm carrying on with the 6,000 Years of Babylon series. We're up to the end of the series. I, I, we're up to study 47. I've written five books, 6,000 Years of Babylon. That's book five. It's actually book four, part two. Uh, book f four it has two parts and it's available from our shop on the website www.ballotministries.org.uk this is the second temptation of Jesus we looked and questioned why the wilderness why do Christians have to go through the wilderness and it's simple because you can't get from Egypt to the promised land without going through the wilderness you can't come out of Babylon and I'm not talking about physical Babylon with us it's spiritual Babylon you can't go from spiritual Babylon to build New Jerusalem the bride of Christ without going through the wilderness it's a 500 mile journey as the crow flies so it's essential that we go through the wilderness. This is where we tested, where we proved, where we have our trials, where we have failures, uh, and where we learn. It said God tested Israel in the wilderness and proved them 40 years. So we're on to the second temptation of Jesus because in the wilderness we get tested and I was saying that Surely we're no better than Jesus. So if Jesus went through this progression, so will we have to. And he, he went through the progression before he ever ministered, before he did a miracle. The first miracle was turning water into wine. We know that. It tells us in John. But before he did any miracles, before he preached, he was baptised and went through the wilderness. So this is a progression of our Christian life. And I don't believe it's a one-off. I think the devil comes many times with these same three temptations. And you may resist the first one. Four years later, you can fall for the second one. And the third one, I think you'll see the next study. Sometimes ministers have been in the ministry for 20 years and they fall for the third temptation. It's not always with us you know, in one week or 40 days, it can be through our life. So let's look at it. I've called this Fulfill Your Divine Destiny. I believe we're all predestined because the Bible says so. Who before knew we predestined? In, in fact, it even says that those who are going to the lake of fire are predestined. God choose vessels for honour and dishonour. You can change. You know, I could be predestined for eternal life, but by rebellion, I could be cut off. And I believe somebody who's predestined for the lake of fire by faith can get in. The Syrophoenician woman, she was outside, but she, her faith got her in and rebellion gets you out, cuts you off. That's, that's where I stand. If you disagree with that, that's all right. That's my understanding of the, the plan of God. So this temptation, it's a progression. Obviously, the devil will try his easiest trick first. If he falls for the easiest trick, he can keep his, his second and third one. If you pass the first one, then you have a stiffer test. So this is a harder temptation. It must be. You don't go in for your GCEs until you pass your 11 plus and you can't get your A levels until you've got your O levels you have to go through the process so this is a tougher test for Jesus whatever we think if we think oh well the first test seems harder to me it doesn't matter what I think or you think there's a progression obviously common sense and it's it's another way to get us out of Babylon by Babylon, I mean the counterfeit religion. In other words, you're doing the works, but not God's will. The devil always wants to get you out of God's will. He knows I'm saved. He can't, he can't do anything about my salvation, can he? The devil can't stop my salvation, but he can stop my rewards. It can get me into religion instead of relationship. It can get me to do God's work and not God's will. And we saw last study, it was a work of iniquity. They cast devils out, they did God's work, but not God's will. So that's the devil's job. He knows you're saved, he can't do anything about that, because it's by faith. 
So, so as long as you believe in God, it, it can't touch you. But it can get you out of God's will. And that's what he was trying to do with Jesus. He was trying to stop Jesus' destiny, which we know was the cross, to die for the world. That's why he came. Well, it's very short dialogue. Matthew 4, verse 6. He came the second time and said unto him, If you're the Son of God. So it's the same words that the insinuation. Is he mocking him? He, he could be mocking him the first time. Surely he wouldn't say it the second time. <coughs> which confirms to me that the Satan wanted to know. He passed the first test. Satan didn't know. He just used the word of God like anyone can. And that doesn't make him the Messiah, does it? So he said, if you're the son of God, a bigger test. If you're son of God, cast yourself down. So he took him to the pinnacle of the temple. I'm sure you know it, but if you don't know, it said the devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and said, jump, cast yourself down. And he said, it is written because Jesus said it is written in the first temptation. Satan says, oh, well, I could use the word of God. He's very clever, he's very cunning. This is a masterclass in the devil's tactics and we shouldn't be, you know, when you quote the word of God, get thee behind me, Satan. He says, oh, you know the word of God, do you? So do I. And he'll bring another scripture. And, and so he said, it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in his hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a toad. In other way, prove your ministry, prove your destiny. Prove you're the Messiah by doing a miracle. Jump off the temple and you've got the word of God to back you up. That's very powerful. People do things and they use the word of God to back them up, but they're listening to the wrong voice. It was Satan who was telling them to do it, not God. And they use scripture and it's a scripture in context. It's from Psalms, I'll read it. It's not out of context. The devil's too clever for that he uses it it's about jesus lest i dash thy foot against a stone so he's saying jesus it's written about you in the psalms david prophesied of jesus it's written about you in the psalms fulfill what david said fulfill your destiny fulfill the prophecy about you how many christians have fulfilled the prophecy that god gave them a true prophecy before the time when God didn't tell them. This is the, 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 the key. Many Christians have, have prophecies over them and the true prophecies, but they don't wait. The devil kids them and they try and do it before the time. They're trying to come in the ministry. They try and fulfill the prophecy before the time. It's not that it's a false prophecy. It's true, but timing is paramount with God. Jesus came in the fullness of time. So how many times do we do good things that would fulfill our destiny without being inspired by God? So let's look at the, the prophecy. Let's look at the study. Let me ask a question because that's how we learn. Do you think for one moment that the devil had the power to take Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple? It says it. He took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and he sat him there and then he said, has Satan power to do that? Don't answer too quick. I'm just posing questions. Was it a vision? Was he praying and fasting and in a vision he saw himself on top of the temple? Well, I don't know what you think. I've come to the conclusion that he was on the top of the temple. And I'll tell you why. The devil said, jump. It's hard to jump out of a vision, isn't it? Because he said, you won't dash your foot against the sun. You won't smash yourself on the ground. So that, that can't happen in a vision, can it? In a dream, you jump off the temple and you fall and you smash yourself. But then you wake up and you're all right. You don't kill yourself. So I think that the, the devil did take him there. It said Satan took him to the pinnacle of the temple. So if you think it's spiritual and he was imagining it, I don't know how you jump out of imagination or jump out of a dream, but I'll leave that with you. I personally think that it was a real situation and Jesus could have jumped off the temple. 
So here's another point. Why did he take him to the pinnacle of the temple? Why not to Mount Sinai? Why not to the highest building? I don't know whether the temple was the highest building. It's not by chance he took him to the pinnacle of the temple. The temple is where Jesus will come to when he returns. It's the place where the man of sin, the one world dictator, will sit before Jesus comes. It's Satan's seat as well as Jesus. The temple is the place where Jesus will come to and rule the nations. But it's the place where Satan will get there first with his man of sin. Let me read it you. Because the false always comes first. The counterfeit comes first. So the real can be established. Saul, the man of the flesh. Then David, the man of God's own heart. Ishmael, the man of the flesh. Then Isaac, the man of the spirit. So the counterfeit, the flesh, always comes first throughout the Bible. The, the man of sin will come first and conquer the world and all the world will worship him before Jesus comes, the real one world dictator. And then the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of this Christ. So it's interesting, isn't it? 2 Thessalonians 2. So this shows that the man of sin will sit in the temple first. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That's Jesus returned to earth by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. Except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the son of damnation. People believe that's the one world dictator, I do. Oh, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped. So he, as God, claiming his God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He'll prove to the world he's God and all the world will worship him. That's amazing. So it's not by chance that Satan took him to the pinnacle of the temple. He's saying, will you be the Christ or the Antichrist? Will you rule for God or will you rule for me? And we'll see the next temptation. That's what he offered Jesus. So it's not by chance. Every detail is important when we're looking at uh, Bible studies. Well, Satan used the same words, it is written, as Jesus. And I need to comment on that because Christians are deceived. Because they believe the word of God whoever speaks it. I don't believe the word of God unless God reveals it to me. Satan issues the word of God. Muslims quote Moses, which is the word of God. They, they believe the Ten Commandments, don't they? They stone women caught in adultery. The Muslims are only like the Jews of the Old Testament. It's a physical law. So they, they believe in stoning people, which is in Moses' law. So I only believe the word of God when he speaks it. When the devil speaks it, it's not the word of God. It becomes a lie. When God speaks the word, it's God's word. When Satan speaks God's words, it becomes a lie because he's trying to deceive us. Truth is what speaks, not what they say. Whatever God says is truth. If God says that wall's green, it's green. If five minutes later he said it's black, it's black. Because God is truth. Whatever God says is the truth. Whatever the devil says is a lie because his intent is to deceive. Truth is meant to enlighten us. Thy word is truth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet it's revelation it's light satan when he quotes the word of god it becomes darkness romans 1 25 i try and substantiate everything i say with the scripture i know some things i say people may think oh, i'm not sure about that but i, I do have scripture and it's talking about uh, false ministers false prophets who changed the truth of God into a lie. How can you turn the truth of God? This is the truth of God. They've turned it into a lie. How can they do that? And worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Romans 1, we think it's about the world. But God handed them over to a reprobate mind. But he's talking to the church. He's talking to Romans. Of course, it applies to the world, but it also applies to us. Because it says we've changed the truth of God into a lie. The world don't change the truth of God into a lie. They don't use the Bible to deceive us, do they? They use Plato and Darwin and other philosophers. They don't use the word of God to deceive us. 
change the truth of God into a lie. Can you see how how we need to hear God speak his word? It's only God's word when he speaks it. It's only my word when I speak it. If you go to somebody and said, Morris said that, and I didn't say it, or they quote exactly what I said, they're telling you what I said it, I'm not speaking it, maybe I wouldn't speak it to that person. Maybe I said to somebody, get lost. And they said, Morris said, get lost. But I didn't say it to that person, I said it to this person. But they're using my words and quoting me and said, Morris said, you've got to get lost. But I didn't say it to that person. You see, God speaks specifically to specific people. I can't take all the promises of God and claim them. I know people say there's 3,000 promises in the Bible and every one are mine. I can't claim those unless God makes them mine. I can't say the promise to Abram, my seed will be like the stars of heaven. That was a promise to Abram. Can I, I say that? And I've seduced every woman in the world and, and Mars and Jupiter and Pluto as well, wouldn't I? To have like the stars of heaven. You see, God says things to specific people. If he says it to you, that's great. But unless he says it to you, it's for somebody else. You can't just claim a promise because there's conditions to the promise. And the conditions to you may be different than the conditions to somebody in the Bible. He said, if you do this, your seed will be like the stars of heaven. But it's, it, it may be a different <laughs> condition to me. So you've, you've got to hear God. You can't just claim a promise if it's not to you. If it's general, of course you can. Without faith, you can't please God. So I can have faith and please God. A general promise I can take, but not a specific one, because it was said to a specific man at a specific time. So I've got to hear the word of God to me. And it may be not in the Bible, or it may be what he said to somebody else, and God applies it to me. That's That's hearing God's voice, isn't it? So many men have gone astray because they've claimed a, a promise in the Bible that wasn't to them. And they've gone off on a tangent and have been disaster. So Satan knows the Bible. He knows all the prophecies of the Bible. And he'll use them to deceive us. So if we can't distinguish God's voice, that's the first temptation. Because Satan's very destructive. He's a master at disguise and impersonation. There's people that can sing like Elvis Presley and, and if you didn't see them singing, you'd think it was Elvis Presley. So if men can deceive you and, and men can talk like Donald Trump and if you didn't see the person who was speaking, you'd think that's Donald Trump because voices are very deceptive and the devil's a master. So he can talk like God. You need to distinguish the two. What's the agenda What's the answer? Well, Jesus' answer is always the key to temp the temptation. In the first temptation, it was nothing to do with stones into bread. It could say, make that cow into a cat. It didn't matter what he said. It was who spoke it. He said, I only listen to God's voice. He told him to do something legitimate, not sinful, but it wasn't the voice of God. So what's this temptation? Well, Jesus' answer will give us the key. Matthew 4, verse 7. Jesus said, it is written again. I'm using the word of God again. This is a battle with the word of God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So it's nothing to do with jumping off a temple. It was tempting God, whatever it was. It could have been a, a million things that he asked him to do. But it, the temptation, the, what he asked him to do wasn't important. It was that he was tempting God. So, Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. This is where Satan took it. It's a, a psalm about Jesus. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So Satan quoted it verbatim. He didn't twist it. He didn't put extra words in, did he? One's Hebrew and one's from Greek. So the slight you know, uh, ofs and twos, different, but it's exactly the same. So he didn't use the word out of context, he used it in context, because it wouldn't deceive Jesus unless it was in context. So it's more deceptive, because it's a specific word. 
they'll dash your foot, you won't dash your foot against a stone. It's not a general word, is it? I can't jump off the temple and think, well, God will have the Empire State Building or Manchester Town Hall and think, no, Jesus, well, I've got the scripture, I won't dash my foot against a stone. It was specific to Jesus. So the devil knew that and he, he told him. And the devil, when you've had a prophecy about the future and you know it's God, the devil will say to you, that was God, you need to fulfill it. Jump, fulfill the... But if you... If God hasn't told you it's the time to fulfill the destiny that God's planned for you, you're tempting God. So Jesus was asked to fulfill his destiny before the time, before God intended. So let me ask a question. What would have happened if Jesus had have jumped? Would they scrape him up? Obviously, the pinnacle of the temple is not going to live, is he? Would he smash his foot? Would he break all the bones in his body? Would he die? Or would the angels have protected him? It's speculation, this obviously. He didn't jump. But what do you think would have happened? I've thought about it. Maybe you haven't thought of it. I think the angels would have protected him. And he wouldn't have dashed his foot against a stone. He'd, he'd gone against God's will. He tempted God. But how many times do we tempt God and God protects us? We, we make mistakes all the time. We're not perfect. And God protects us. He doesn't smash us because we make a mistake. There's people who've done terrible things. There's pastors who, uh, who've committed terrible sins. And even the world would judge them. God doesn't write them off. We can repent. We can get back on the horse. God's not a vindictive God, is he? If if we're not rebellious, if we humble ourselves and say, God, I've blown it, I've made a mistake, I'm in the ministry and look what I've done. If you humble yourself, God will forgive you. If you're rebellious, that's different. But I don't think Jesus would have died, but he'd have missed God's will. He'd have tempted God. And to, to disobey God or to do something that God hasn't told you to do, he wouldn't be sinless, would he? He'd have failed. He couldn't have been the Messiah, but he'd have lived. That's what I think if you think he, the, God would have written him off and he would have destroyed and ruined his, his plan and God would have to bring another saviour to the world. Don't forget God's God. If Jesus had failed, God's plan wouldn't fail. He'd send another, maybe he'd have another son, I don't know. But I know God's plan cannot fail. I know Jesus could, he was tempted. You can't be tempted if you can't fail, can you? What, what's the point? You don't go in for an exam if you're going to pass. They don't put you in for the exam. The exam is to see whether you pass or fail. So Jesus could have failed, he was in flesh and blood. He didn't, thank God. But God's plan would never fail because God is God. Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, all things are possible to you, change your plan. Take this cup away. I don't want to die. I, I can't face it. Nevertheless, I'll do your will. But it shows that he knew God could save the world by, to be ridiculous, God could save the world by Jesus eating bananas if that was God's plan. God's God. It was God's plan that he die and shed his blood. But he came to do his father's will. Jesus didn't come to die in that sense. Nobody wants to die. He came to do his father's will. Isaac didn't want to die, but he was a willing sacrifice. It was Abram's plan to kill his son, not Isaac. He was just the willing sacrifice. And God so loved the world. It never said Jesus loved the world. It says God so loved the world. He gave his son. And the son was a willing sacrifice. So it is God's sacrifice, not Jesus. Jesus was the sacrifice. But God sacrificed his son. It's all about God. He, he gave his son. And the son didn't want to do it in the flesh. But he said, nevertheless, your will be done. So that proves that Jesus was in flesh and blood and he could have failed. Or he, God wouldn't test him. You can't fail. There's no temptation. It doesn't. It defies logic, doesn't it? So I don't think he'd have died, but he'd have tempted God. And what's so wrong about testing God? Prove me now, Malachi, prove me now. That's not tempting God. That's proving God's word. That's different. 
God tells us to prove his word, act in faith, do this, that, that's different. God tests us, we don't test God, we don't tempt God. God tests us, let me show you. Genesis 22 verse 12. Abram is the father of faith. And real faith is obedience to God's word. Presumption is acting in faith without instructions from God to do it. I can't say, well, I'm acting in faith if God didn't tell me. I'm acting in faith, I'm going to start a church. If God didn't tell me to do it, I'm, rebel I'm, I'm presumptuous, aren't I? Faith is all linked to obedience. The f example is Abram, the father of faith. And when you act in presumption, even though you're acting in faith, when God hasn't told you to do it, you're moving out of God's will. And maybe God will bless you because he honours faith, but you've moved out of his will. You can still cast demons out and heal the sick and praise the God and prophesy because God's give you the gift. You can use it when you want, even if you're backslidden. I had a man who, in my dad's church and he backslid and he, he, he became a womanizer and a, a drunkard. And he used to knock at my door at midnight, blotto, and I, I want to come and pray with you. And he'd be speaking in tongues because God had given them the gifts, the gifts and call and without repentance. If, if, if I give you a thousand pound, you can use it how you want. I've no control over it. I've given it you. You can buy drugs with it and kill yourself or you can bless the poor. But once I've given you the gift, it's yours. It's not conditional, the gift. He doesn't say, I'll give you the gift, but I'll take it away if you misuse it. And so Christians can misuse the gifts. That's the, that's the problem. You can misuse the gifts because you, you've got control over it. You're out of God's will, and God doesn't write you off. The gifts and calling are without repentance. You're still called even if you're backslidden, even if you're using the ministry for your own ends. It's, it's quite serious, isn't it? So... God tested Abram. Have I got the scripture? This is this is Genesis 12. This is when Abram, uh, 22, sorry, verse 12. This is when Abram had, had going to sacrifice his son. And God said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything, for now I know that thou fearest God. See, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. What happened? Did Abram want to prove his faith? Did Abram get up one morning and say, Sarah, I feel faith. I'm going to prove my faith. I'm going to sacrifice my own son to God. I love God so much. I've got so much faith that I believe God can raise him from the dead if I sacrifice him. I'll prove God. Now, Abraham did believe that God could raise his son, it tells us. So he knew that, that God would raise his son. But that wasn't his attitude, was it? I'll prove, I'll prove my faith. I'll kill my son and God can raise him again. It was God that instigated it. He had no idea of God's plan and destiny for his life. It must have been a surprise when God told him to kill the child of promise. Don't forget, he had Ishmael for 13 years. Ishmael was circumcised before I was, Isaac was born. A year before Isaac was born, Ishmael was circumcised. So Abraham must have thought for 13 years, this is my only child, it's the child of promise. His seed will be like the stars of heaven. And when he was circumcised, the next day God said, it's not Ishmael, your wife will have a son, it's not through anyone else. And so he had no idea when Isaac came that he'd have to sacrifice him. It must have come as a shock. Abram, one morning, yes Lord, I want you to go and sacrifice your son. What a shock. He had no idea, this was the child of promise. And he, he, God's tell him to sacrifice. He had no idea of the plan. It wasn't faith. It was obedience. He got up. And Galatians tells us, I I, I've not got it now, but Galatians tells us that Abram's, uh, James, sorry, works without faith. That's it. That Abram's works were his faith. The works prove your faith. Faith without action is only a belief. The devils believe they've got no faith because they're rebellious, they don't act on it. But faith is acting on what you believe in your head. Believing is in your head. 
Faith is when you act on it. Faith is the evidence that you did believe. Faith isn't believing, it's the evidence you did believe. The substance, substance is tangible, this is substance. You can't believe it in your head, faith in your head is not faith, it's belief. You believe God could do it, faith is when you act upon it, faith is the evidence, that's the definition in Hebrews. Faith is the evidence of things you hope for, what you believed, you bring it to pass. Faith is when you've got evidence. Before that, you're only believing. Abram proved his faith. He believed God. But he could have said, God's told me I've got to sacrifice my son. He could have believed that till he died. He knew God had told him. He believed it. But it wasn't faith. Faith was when he got up out of his seat, got on his horse, saddled his ass and went to kill Isaac. That was faith. So God tested Abram, God tempted Abram. We don't tempt God. God wasn't testing, Abram wasn't testing God. We've got so, some examples. God tested Joseph. It said God tried Joseph. Joseph didn't tempt God. Joseph's a wonderful example of waiting for your divine destiny. Joseph had a wonderful prophecy Joseph had the prophecy that one day his, his, his brothers and his mother and father would all bow down to him. His father knew what it meant. He said, is your mother and I and all your brothers going to bow down to you? Preposterous, Joseph, you're the youngest. But Joseph kept it in his heart. Can you think of any incident in all of Joseph's lives where he tried to fulfil it? I can't. In fact, God took him away from it. His promise was that his brothers and sister, his brothers and his mother and father would bow down to him. God took him out to Egypt. How could he fulfill God's destiny in Egypt? I must go back to Israel. I must go back. I must escape. He never tried to escape to go back to fulfill God's destiny. It was in Egypt in the world. And he was in prison. He didn't complain. He said he waited patiently. The word of God tried him until his time came. I think I've got the scripture. I hope I have. Psalm 105. It's going through the history of Israel. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. That's going against your destiny. He's going less and less and less. He ends up as a jailbird accused of raping his boss's wife. How far away is that from greatness? Whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. No destiny there. Until the time that his word came. That's so important. The word came to him. You need to wait if you've been prophesied over for the word to come to you. Now's the time. Now evangelize. Now build the church. Now do this. Now do that. You've got, it's not enough to hear the word of the God to be prophesied over. There's been some wonderful prophecies over people and they've blown it because they've tried to fulfill it. Joseph is a wonderful example like Jesus until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tested him. And took him away from the promise. How can I fulfill it now? I've had a heart attack. How can I fulfill my promise now? I'm 87, Lord. How can I ever fulfill that? How can I build a church at my age? God's not told me to build a church, but I'm just postulating. How can I build a church at my age? I haven't even got the energy to run round the block, Lord. Never mind run round after people. I can't run a church at... <coughs> God's testing you. Abraham wasn't called, uh, Moses wasn't called till he was 80. Had three years off that. And he delivered a whole nation. See, when he was young, he tried to fulfill his destiny and he killed one Egyptian and freed one Israelite. That's what you do when you fulfill your destiny. You, you do it, but it's so small. It's a thousand percent of what God really wanted. So he delivered Israel, one Israelite, and killed an Egyptian. But when he'd been through the wilderness, 40 years in the world, 40 years in the wilderness, when he was 80, then God said, now the word of the Lord is fulfilled. Because it said when he killed the Egyptian, 
He didn't understand why Israel didn't understand. He says he didn't understand that they knew. He knew that one day he would deliver Israel. He already had the promise when he killed the Egyptian and he tried to do it. He, he had the deliverer in him. But it wasn't the time. And he did it in the flesh, so he killed one. And he had to run. And that's how God works. Maybe God's merciful and we blow it. He blew it and he had to run. And God says, it's all right, Moses. You're fulfilling your destiny. But it's nothing to what? I'll, I'll put you in the desert. I'll put you in the wilderness. I'll, I'll take you out of all that grandeur. I'll take you out of the ministry and put you in the wilderness. And then when you're ready, I'll call you. So when he was 80, he delivered two and a half million people and destroyed every demon in Egypt because if Pharaoh's Satan, then all his armies are the demons. So he delivered a whole nation and drowned Pharaoh in the depths of the sea. The Pharaoh who brought him up. Can you see, if you wait for God's timing, and this is what all this is about, will Jesus try and fulfill his destiny before the time? And achieve very little. You know, Israel as a nation tempted God. I can't emphasize how much we don't tempt God. He tempts us. He tests us. We don't test God. We prove him. That's different. But I'm talking about test God. You don't tempt God. Israel tempted God. Let me read it here. Exodus 17.2 Whereover, wherefore, the people did chide with Moses. And they said, give us water to drink. And Moses said unto them, why are you chiding with me? Why are you arguing me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? God wouldn't have let them starve to death. They'd seen the miracles, the place on Egypt. They'd seen the Red Sea open. And they were yelping about, oh, there's no food and no water. They didn't trust God. They were tempting God and moaning and groaning. Complaining is, is, is tempting God. You don't trust him. It's an insult to God when you complain. Lord, I've no money. Lord, I've no ministry. You complain and you're a moaning and you're testing God. Why chide with me? Why, why do you tempt God? And Psalm 78, this was when they were asking, they tempted God again, asking for quails. And it is, David's going through the history of Israel. He said, how often did they provoke God in the wilderness and grieve God in the desert. They grieve. When you tempt God, you grieve him. He's saying, oh, why won't they wait for me? Why won't they wait? Why don't they learn patience and long suffering? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. You say, well, you can't limit God. Of course you can't. God's all powerful. You can't limit him. But he can't do what he wants if you go before the time when Moses tried to deliver Israel and kill one and destroyed one. He was tempting God. God couldn't fulfill his plan through that, could he? It was before the time. And God couldn't do what he wanted because it wasn't time to deliver Israel. Moses wasn't the meekest man on earth till he'd been through the wilderness. That's why he went through the wilderness to humble him and make him the meekest man on the planet. They murmured and rebelled and tempted God. Well, Paul understood the principle. Galatians 2.20 It's God who tests us. I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead. So how can a dead man have faith? How can a dead man tempt God? His flesh was dead. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm not dead physically. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now that's the authorised version. All the other versions, the NIV and the New American, all the versions, they say, I live by faith in the Son of God. So that's Paul's faith in God. I I live by faith in the Son of God. It's my faith in God. That's why I do miracles. I believe God. But Paul said he's a dead man. That's why I believe this translation. I live by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, it's God's faith in me. 
not my faith in God. If it's your faith in God, you can act in presumption, can't you? Because I've got faith in God, and it may be presumption, not faith. But if you're dead, and it's the faith of Christ in you, you how can you act in presumption? It's Christ's faith in you. God's give you the faith. It's not your faith. You're not exercising your faith. You're dead. I'm crucified with Christ. It's God's faith in me. God puts the faith in me, and you believe it despite yourself. You can't not believe it. So I, I love that version. So Paul understood. He says, I'm not living by faith in God. I'm living by the faith of God. It's his faith in me, not my faith in God. I b believe that's a, an important distinction. If you don't, that's all right. But I, I base my life on that. That It's not my faith in God. I want to be dead. And I want Christ to have his faith in me. I'll give you an illustration of it. It's not in the notes, but... Peter and John go into the temple, gate, uh, Acts of the Apostles. They see a, a man begging, and he begged from his mother's womb, it said, he, he begged there. So Jesus had been to the temple many times with his disciples. They must have passed the man, arms, arms, and I'm sure Jesus gave them Judas, he was the treasurer, give him a few shekels, you know. So they must have passed the man many times, and so they did good works. Peter and John weren't going to give alms. They weren't going to preach the gospel. They were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. So they were going to a prayer meeting, weren't they? The hour of prayer. They're walking along and this man says, alms, alms. And, uh, and like they do, it was automatic. Peter felt in his pocket. He said, Gornish, skin, nothing. He said, I I'm sorry, I've no money. And then the faith of God leapt in his heart. He says, but I'll tell you what I've got. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man jumped up. And I believe that Peter and John got a bigger shot than the man. Because it wasn't premeditated. It was the faith of God, spontaneous. You know what we do because we've got the plan. Well, we can't pray for the sick because we've not preached the gospel. The gospel's more important than his, his healing because... He's healing, he'll die again and go to hell. So we need to preach the gospel. So we always preach the gospel and then pray for the sick. That's not biblical. Jesus just healed people. Sometimes he never preached and he's showing the power of God. Why don't we pray for the sick so they can sit comfortably in the meeting and get out of the wheelchair and hear the word of God? But we've got the formula, you see. So what we would do is say, Peter, we've got no money. Let's heal it. Let's pray. We've got the power of God. But first of all, his salvation, his soul's more important. You preach to him, John, and I'll pray for him. That's what we do. Preach the gospel first and then we'll pray. They never thought about anything. They were just thinking, I've no money. And then the Holy Ghost took over and he said, I've silver and gold, I've none. But I've, what I've got, I'll give you in the name of Jesus. That's the faith of the Son of God. And that, for me, that's a good example. Spontaneous faith comes in and you do the miracle. You don't hype it up. You don't preach faith into the people because you've got none. A person who preaches the faith sermon to get miracles, it's because he's got no faith. He's the man of God. How can you preach faith? This man's 30 years arthritis, sat in a wheelchair suffering, and you're expecting him to have faith. You're the man of God. Just heal him if you've got the power. Jesus didn't preach faith. Where's Jesus' faith? He just did miracles. If you've got the power, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. He didn't say preach faith to them. He says your faith has made you whole. You've come to the meeting. You must believe in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. I, I, I can't understand how people hype faith and get the faith levels up. It's because they've got none. They're the man of God. They're the powerful one. We've got the, the whole gifts of the Spirit. They've got none. You've got to lead by example, haven't you? Not expect them to have faith when you're the man of God. Anyway, I'll get off my hobby horse. All right, back to my notes. Let me let me finish. I'm on the last page. So Jesus came through the temptation because he wouldn't tempt his father. His answer was. I'll not tempt the Lord of God. It doesn't matter what you tell me to do. If you ask me to tempt God and fulfill my destiny before the time, the answer's no, Satan. I'm not. I'm waiting till the word of God came. Jesus knew that. All through John, I think five times, he knew his time was not yet. And they tried to throw him over the brow of the hill, but his time was not yet. 
And what did Jesus say before Gethsemane? He knew his time had come. Jesus knew. He said, the time's come. They're going to betray me and you'll betray me. He said, my hour is come. Jesus knew when his hour came. He wasn't tempting God. He knew his time had come. Now is the time I've got to die. He didn't try and die before it. He slept through the storm on the sea. He thought, well, some fairy and the devil can do what he wants. All the storms can't kill me because I can't drown. I've got to shed my blood. And you don't shed blood when you're drowning so he could sleep through it. It wasn't his time. It was drowning, not shedding blood. So he, he, he waited and he said to the disciples, my hour has come. God's told me, now's the time. He waited for the word of the God. Even Jesus waited till his time came. Can you see how important it is? If you only learn that from this study, wait on God. Don't worry about the wilderness. Don't worry about the temptations. Jesus went through it, but it wasn't his time. He says, I'm not tempting God. It's not time to fulfill it. So it'll be the same for us. God will tell us, use the gifts before the time. Show the power of God. Show you're a mighty man of God. Do miracles. To show you're a mighty man of God, it's the wrong motive, isn't it? Where's the compassion? Jesus didn't heal himself to prove he was God. He said he was moved with compassion. He saw somebody sick and he didn't think, oh, if I do this miracle, the crowds will come. I've been sat on platforms in America with ministers and they say, if that person gets healed, that will bring the crowds and the money, of course, they mean. You know, it, it's wrong motive. Why not be moved with compassion and say, look what the devil's done to that person. They were made to be walk on the two feet and they crippled. Jesus was moved with compassion. He wasn't trying to prove his ministry. That's ego, isn't it? How easy it is for pride. I'm talking about myself. How easy it is for pride to come in your ministry and you want to prove it. And rather than be moved with compassion, unless the motive is love, it's wood, hay and stubble. Unless, though I give my body to burn, I have gifts of the Spirit, I have faith to move my and have not love. It's got to be compassion, the motive. Motive is king with God. It's not what you do, it's why you do it. You can make a mistake if your motive is right, God will honour it. If my child makes a mistake when they're trying to do me something good, I don't smack them. I smack them when they're rebellious. If they're trying to do good for me, if they say I'll make you breakfast and they make me breakfast in bed and the eggs are all runny and the, bur the bacon is a burnt offering, I still thank them. I say thanks very much. That was lovely. Because they've made the effort. They've got it wrong, but they wanted to please me. You, you praise the motive, not the action. And God looks at the heart, not the action. We judge actions because we can't see the heart. So let me come to an end. I believe many good men have fallen for the temptation. I'm saying good men because you don't go in the ministry to fail, do you? Many men have used the ministry and the gifts of the Holy Ghost to make them rich, to make them give them status, to, to do lots of things. That's the wrong motive. They're tempting God. Wait, maybe God give you the gifts, but wait till God humbles you in the wilderness and then the last thing you'll want to do is boast about your wealth the last thing you'll want to do is have status and hope you meet presidents that's the last thing you want to do if you meet presidents that's great if you're rich that's great but that's not your motive it's so subtle and they've fallen for the second temptation so we do discernment in the last days don't we so many conferences I, I see especially women's conferences I'm not uh, I'm not uh, against women, of course, but women are on the rise, aren't they, in the world, emancipation, and in the church as well. And there's so many conferences, find your destiny, fulfill your divine destiny. And there's seminars, how to fulfill your destiny. And I think they're wrong. I'm not supposed to fulfill my destiny. If God's given me a destiny, that's all right. I've got to wait for the word of the Lord. I've got to be tested first. I don't bring about my destiny. Joseph didn't bring about his destiny. He told a vision to Potiphar. He wasn't trying to fulfill his destiny. He wasn't trying to make his mother and father bow down to him. He was in Egypt. He forgot them. Daniel, he wasn't trying to fulfill his destiny. He told a vision and he was elevated. 
God's destiny for Daniel was that he would rule in Neb, uh, under Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. He was next to the king, wasn't he? But he didn't try and do it. He was elevated despite himself. It was God who now's the time, say with Joseph. We've got to be careful. Jesus' answer was shortened to the point. You don't need to talk long dialogue to the devil, you know. Get thee behind me, it is written. He said, I don't tempt God. It's not my time to be in the temple or to jump off it. I've not got to go to the temple and prove myself at this time. In fact, he, he didn't prove himself in the temple in his first coming. It'll be his second coming that will sit in the temple of God. So it's well before the time. The gifts of God and the power of God are to minister to others. This is my part in shot. The gifts that God gives to us as ministers are to minister to others, not to elevate or vindicate us or our ministry. The gifts aren't to vindicate my ministry. The gifts aren't to make me rich or give me status. God gives me the power of God and the gifts of the Spirit to minister to others. That's the motive. We're ministers. We're servants. We don't become lords. I'm going to pray that God will help us. Father, I've done my best to explain this second temptation as far as I understand it. And I pray if I've missed anything out that you'll give people understanding. But I wanted to get across that we don't tempt God. We've got to wait and God will fulfill our divine destiny. We can't do anything about that. Only wait till the time comes. Please help us, Father. We, we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful. Not I never knew you. Please help us, Father. I ask it in your name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. See you for the next study of the third temptation. Only one answer. I'm looking forward to it.